Good evening and welcome to The Body Politic. I'm Peter Gorovich. Tonight, it's the politics of immigration. Senators Barack Obama and John McCain were both in San Diego this month for the National Council of the Rasa Conference, and both candidates addressed a high priority for this audience, immigration reform. We'll hear from the two senators in a moment, and then some analysis from two leading experts on immigration policy. We have Wayne Cornelius, the director of the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies at UCSD. He's also, we should point out, a member of Senator Obama's Immigration Policy Advisory Committee, but he does not speak for the Obama campaign. Gordon Hansen is the director of the Center on Pacific Economies at the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies here at UCSD. And he's the author of Why Does Immigration Divide America? Public Finance and Political Opposition to Open Borders. Welcome to both of you. Before we get started, let's listen to what the candidates had to say on immigration. The system isn't working when 12 million people living in hiding and hundreds of thousands are crossing our borders illegally each year. When companies hire undocumented immigrants instead of legal citizens because they want to avoid paying overtime or avoid unionization or exploiting those workers, when communities are terrorized by ICE immigration raids, when nursing mothers are torn from their babies, when children come home from school to find their parents missing, when people are detained without access to legal counsel, when all that's happening, the system just isn't working and we need to change it. Let me address with you one other issue important to all of us. As you know, I and many other colleagues twice attempted to pass comprehensive immigration legislation. <laughs> to fix our broken borders, ensure respect for the laws of this country, recognize the important economic contribution of immigrant laborers, apprehend those who came here illegally to commit crimes, and deal practically and humanely with those who came here, as my distant ancestors did, to build a better, safer life for their families, without excusing the fact that they came here illegally or granting them privileges before those who have been waiting their turn outside the country. Many Americans didn't believe us when we said we would secure our borders, so we failed in our efforts. I don't want to fail again to achieve comprehensive immigration reform, and we must not. We must prove we have the resources to secure our borders and use them while respecting the dignity and rights of citizens with legal residents and those of legal residents of the United States of America. When we have achieved our border security goal, we must enact and implement the other parts of practical, fair, and necessary immigration policy. We have economic and humanitarian responsibilities as well, and they require no less dedication from us in meeting them. I know, I know Senator McCain used to buck his party on immigration by fighting for uh, comprehensive reform, and I admired him for it and joined him in it. But when he was running for his party's nomination, he abandoned that courageous stance and said that he wouldn't even support his own legislation if it came up for a vote. I don't know about you, but I think it's time for a president who won't walk away from something as important as comprehensive reform just because it becomes politically unpopular. That's the commitment I'm making to you. I marched with you in the streets of Chicago. I fought for you in the Senate. And I will make it a top priority in my first year as President of the United States of America. Not, not just because we need to secure our borders and get control of who comes in to this country, not just because we have to crack down on employers who are abusing undocumented immigrants, but because we have to finally bring those 12 million people out of the shadows and give them a pathway. Yes, they broke the law, and we should not excuse that. 
We should require them to pay a fine. We should require them to learn English. They should go to the back of the line for citizenship behind those who came here legally. But we cannot and should not have 12 million people in the shadows. That would turn America into something we're not, something we don't want to be. And while we work to strengthen our borders, we need a practical solution for the problem of 12 million people who are here without documentation, many of whom have lived and worked here for years. That's why we need to offer those who are willing to make amends a pathway to citizenship. That way, we can reconcile our values as both a nation of immigrants and a nation of laws. We can do both, and that's what I intend to do when I'm President of the United States. At a moment of great difficulty in my campaign, when my critics said it would be political suicide for me to do so, I helped author with Senator Kennedy comprehensive immigration reform and fought for its package not one but twice. I cast a lot of hard votes, as did the other Republicans and Democrats who, enjoy, who joined our bipartisan effort. So did Senator Kennedy. I took my lumps for it without complaint. My campaign was written off as a lost cause. I did so not just because I believed it was the right thing to do for Hispanic Americans. It was the right thing to do for all Americans. That's why I did it. Senator Obama declined to cast some of those tough votes. He voted for and even sponsored amendments that were intended to kill the legislation, amendments that Senator Kennedy and I voted against. I never asked for any special privileges from anyone just for having done the right thing. Doing my duty to my country is its own reward. But I do ask for your trust that when I say I remain committed to fair, practical, and comprehensive immigration reform. I mean it. I mean it. I'd like to start out by trying to frame the problem, the dimension of the problem. How many people are coming? What's the size of this? And why are they coming here? Gordon, maybe we'll start with you. So right now in the United States, there are about 37 million immigrants. That's about 12% of the U.S. population. So one in every eight Americans is someone who was, um, or uh, one in every eight folks who are living in the country is someone who was born uh, elsewhere. Of that group, about 12 million are illegal immigrants. So uh, roughly one third of the, the total immigrant population. So that's the numbers who are here right now. In terms of the, the, the population coming in each year, though it's dropped off a bit in the past couple of years, the average over the last decade or so is an inflow of around four or 500,000 new illegal immigrants and around a million legal immigrants. Wayne, what are your thoughts? Do the benefits outweigh the costs? What are, you, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, my reading of the economic data are that, in fact, the average American uh, does benefit, mm -hmm. uh, if only as consumers who are paying relatively lower prices for the goods and services that are produced with immigrant labor. Mm -hmm. I mean, Alan Greenspan used to point out frequently that immigration has an inflation dampening effect. Um, that continues to be the case today. Uh, very few U.S. born workers in our labor force are ever in a situation in which they are competing directly mm -hmm. with immigrants for jobs. Mm -hmm. So the costs are are very real in terms of public finances in areas where there are large concentrations of immigrants. But the average American is not likely to directly experience them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of a complicated thing, an average American, an average impact. Should we be talking about an average impact or should we be talking about where is it concentrated? I mean, I don't know what an average means. Politically, an average doesn't tell us very much. Part of where the political controversy comes from is that the, the burden sharing of those costs of immigration is quite unequal. Uh, when you think about who pays for those public services, it's taxpayers in states and communities where, where immigrants settle. 
Now, the immigrants who come here, legal or illegal, pay taxes. Um, the most uh, illegal immigrants, or at least many illegal immigrants, uh, present Social Security cards, uh, valid or not, to their employers, uh, who then make, uh, uh, make withdrawals that ends up in the, the pocket of the federal government. Uh, many of those folks also pay income taxes as a way of establishing a paper trail in, in hopes of uh, establishing themselves in the U.S. economy. So the federal government in the U.S. enjoys tax gains from immigration. States and communities end up with the bill. Immigrants also pay sales taxes, which benefit local governments and renters taxes. So there are, there are revenue streams, but Gordon's right that the most important ones are going off to the federal government. So what are the solutions, since there's a lot of intensity and controversy over this, what are the solutions? If, if we want to reduce the number of illegal immigrants in America, what are the solutions? Gordon, you want to start? Well, what you heard Barack Obama saying is that uh, we've got to legalize the existing stock of illegal immigrants in the United States. So there's a very strong sense among, on both sides of the political aisle uh, in this country that the presence of large numbers of undocumented individuals undermines our rule of law and has consequences, uh, adverse consequences for civil society. Now, you know, there, that seems plausible. We don't actually have a lot of research to, to verify that that's in fact uh, uh, true. So, uh, in a sense, the easy part of immigration reform is dealing with people who are already here. They've worked hard. Uh, they've come here with the, the promise of, uh, of ultimately getting, an implicit promise of ultimately becoming part of U.S. society if they just play by the rules, and, and the vast majority of them have done so. The much more difficult part of the problem is what do you do about future inflows of illegal immigrants? And that's where things get complicated. Well, Wayne, Senator McCain talked about securing our borders. His emphasis was that's the number one priority for him. What does that mean? How would you secure our, our borders and what does it cost? Does it work? Well, we've been trying to do that for the last 15 years. We've invested tens of billions of dollars uh, in a strategy to discourage would-be uh, migrants from even leaving their homes in their home countries. Uh, it's been an egregious failure, at least in terms of actually keeping undocumented immigrants out of, out of the country, out of our labor markets. Uh, we have proven that you cannot use that strategy to accomplish that end. Uh, and in addition, it has produced all sorts of unintended consequences, which are really quite serious including enlarging the resident permanent settled population of undocumented immigrants in this country, which does increase uh, the impact on uh, local and state public services. Um, we have uh, demonstrated that this kind of a policy uh, is a huge boon to the people smuggling industry. Uh, that industry has mushroomed over the last 15 years. Uh, it has also resulted directly in more than 4,700 deaths at the border because migrants continued to cross in the less well-fortified areas, but areas that were more remote and much more dangerous. Uh, so you have a strategy, a border-focused strategy of immigration control, which has not kept undocumented migrants out of the country, has not discouraged them from trying to come, and which has produced this plethora of, of unintended consequences. Yeah. Why has that happened? Because we have done nothing significant and systematic to reduce the demand for the labor in our economy. Mm -hmm. And absent that, mm -hmm. there is no realistic prospect that border enforcement alone mm -hmm. uh, will have a a significant deterrent effect. Well, so I mean, that's sort of a puzzle, quite honestly. I don't know, does that mean that we're not capable of enforcing a law? I mean, you're saying there's a tremendous pull because there are jobs here. Does that mean that we're not capable, our big army, police, all this, we can't, we can't stop people from crossing our border? We're not capable of, of, of enforcing an unrealistic law. Gordon? So the, um, the challenge we face in, in thinking about reform is trying to convert those, those illegal immigrants who will be coming in the future into legal immigrants of some kind. Um, John McCain is proposing that we need border enforcement to help make that happen. What neither McCain nor Obama are talking about are the details about 
new legal inflows. But both of them say hazy things about a guest worker program of, of some kind. In terms of affecting the demand for illegal immigrants, that involves intrusions into the workplace. It involves monitoring U.S. employers. If you look today at the countries that succeed in having uh, uh, tightly run and, uh, and effective guest worker programs, none of them are democratic. They're all authoritarian countries, the Gulf states, Singapore. And that's in part because to regulate uh, legal immigration of low-skilled workers, you need to sacrifice something in terms of, of, of civil liberties. And we as a country have been unwilling uh, to do so. So is Europe. And so the, so, the byproduct I mean, of that is... So why is it a violation of civil liberties to tell an employer that he has to verify that these people have legal status here? That's not, that's not where the violation will come in. What we're gonna, I think what we're going to steadily see is, uh, is electronic verification of the employability of, of workers in large workplaces. But then what will employers do? They'll subcontract tasks to small shops that will then operate in the underground economy. How do you police, um, uh, how do you monitor those, those, under, those, those establishments that, that do go small, that do go into the, to the gray sector? Well, you need much more active enforcement than we've ever had. And there's just an unwillingness in the United States to accept that sort of, of intrusion. So we keep talking about a guest worker program. I think in the end, it's going to be politically unrealistic to have uh, a regulatory system that the American public would be comfortable with. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an issue. Wait, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, I must take issue with Gordon's Please. statement that, We're that here to uh, Senator Obama does not have a specific plan for fixing the legal immigration system mm -hmm. or structuring a guest worker program. In fact, there are quite detailed plans. They're on the campaign's website. I helped to develop some of the provisions. Uh, so there's a very clear idea of, of where we should be going, and partly that builds on the 2006 and 2007 comprehensive immigration reform bills, mm -hmm. uh, which did uh, have majority support in the Senate, but died in the House, or died in the Senate the second time around because of a, an inability to get closure on the debate. So there is something to build upon. So tell us about in that legislation, what would you identify in that failed legislation that might have been effective that might come back on the agenda? Well, I think uh, the, the key elements uh, of both 2006 and 2007 have to be there when it gets back onto the table. There has to be a, uh, a much more stringent and electronically verified system of worksite enforcement. Uh, there still has to be a, a significant effort to secure the borders. Uh, there has to be a relatively large and well-functioning temporary worker program, and there have to be uh, a variety of fixes to the system by which we admit legal permanent uh, uh, immigrants. And uh, it's not rocket science. Uh, there are some tough choices that would have to be made uh, to get the final legislation, uh, but everybody more or less agrees on the roadmap. You don't agree. I mean, it sounds like you think a lot of these things can't happen or well, are unrealistic. I, well, I think um, I, I agree that with, with what Wayne has said in terms of those are the elements of immigration reform uh, that we need. Where what no package has addressed is, uh, is defining a guest worker program on the scale that would be sufficient to absorb the demand for illegal labor that we've observed over the last decade and a half. The numbers that are being discussed um, would, would take care of a couple of years of, of inflows. And then after that, there'd be this pent-up demand. So unless you're going to massively increase the scale of illegal immigration, there's going to be tension there uh, in the system. Another thing the plans haven't worked out is how you design a guest worker program that is going to satisfy employers. What are some of the things employers like about illegal immigrants? Uh, they're motivated and they're mobile. Um, they, they show up when you want them and where, and, and where you want them. Right now, our existing guest worker programs require employers uh, to file far in advance. They're very bureaucratically burdensome. Um, and we'd be asking the Department of Homeland Security to manage this. Department of Homeland Security right now can't tell us how many people are in the country on H-1B visas, the visas for, for skilled workers. Yet somehow they're going to manage a much, much larger program uh, for guest workers. 
So there are a lot of hurdles that we need to clear before we can get to that point. And it's hard to imagine that we're going to be in a position to do so in less than five or ten years. Wayne, is that outline of that program that you're suggesting realistic? And the well, the, the, the devil is always in the details right. when it comes particularly to, to temporary worker programs. Mm -hmm. But many of the problems that Gordon has uh, cataloged are, are not inherent in the concept of a temporary worker program. And there are best practices that can be learned from the experiences of other countries. It's certainly no substitute for a major fix of the permanent legal immigration system. Mm -hmm. And conceptually, it's, it's problematic when you're using a guest worker program to rotate workers in and out of what are de facto permanent jobs. Um, so it's not uh, a, a, a fix for every employer's needs, nor for so every So what would migrant. a fix be, a visa system, a more coherent visa system? What you would need both. You need both. You need realistic quotas, both employment-based visas and family-based ba visas. You do need a temporary option for migrants who don't want to uh, pull up stakes and transfer all of their family and their economic base to this country. Uh, and over the longer term, you need to reduce the supply of migrants by creating alternatives to immigration in the first place, in the areas from which they come, through targeted development projects. Is that something we can do in the United States? Is that really up to us? Is it up to us to tell Mexico they have to do X, Y, and Z so that they'll have more economic development? Is that realistic? It's hard to see that it work. I mean, the, the income, did we, the, uh, you get an increase in earnings of three times in moving, in moving across the border. Take NAFTA. Okay, so NAFTA, there was a major political effort to get NAFTA passed. The most optimistic estimates about NAFTA's impact on wages for, for Mexican workers was that it increased average earnings on the order of 10 percent. That's a, just a tiny share of the, the income gain that you, that you enjoy by going from one country to the next. So I, I certainly would see the value in that targeted development, but I think it's not very realis realistic to think that it's going to have uh, make much of a dent in, in the near term. What's going to make a dent are changes that are already happening uh, in Mexico. Mexico is undergoing a dramatic change in its demographic structure. Like the U.S., it had a baby boom, except its baby boom came a generation after ours. And that baby boom has been entering the labor force over the past 20 years. But it's crested. Fertility rates in, in Mexico have plummeted, and they're now just a little bit above U.S. levels. Looking 25 years out, those population pressures, those labor supply pressures for immigration are going to weaken substantially. The question is, how do we get from where we are now to that more comfortable point in the future? You're talking about the next generation. Right. I'm focused on the current generation yeah, that's and their children. So what should, let's talk, we don't have a lot of time left. Let's talk about favorite solutions or things that haven't been mentioned that are possible solutions that you would put on the table. Suggestions, favorite solutions that aren't on the table yet? Well, I would certainly de-emphasize border enforcement, which has proven to be not a cost-effective approach with all of these unintended consequences, mm -hmm. and, and devote more resources to worksite enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be a, a more humane approach, uh, trying to keep them out of workplaces mm -hmm. than trying to stop them at the border. Mm -hmm. uh, and clearly, border enforcement, as we have known it for the last right. 15 years, has not right. worked. Sounds like it would bring back on the table an identity card because so much of this stuff is how do you know who that person is and what their history is? And that's another program, an identity card. Should we have one in America? Gordon, what's your favorite solution here? Well, to make the allocation of visas market-based, uh, part of the problem is that who, uh, the number of people we decide to, uh, to admit is completely unresponsive to what's happening in the, in the broader economy, mm -hmm. whereas illegal immigration is very responsive to market signals. So if we want to replace illegal immigration with legal immigration, we need to incorporate that responsiveness. One way to do that is uh, a version of, uh, some version of auctioning visas, mm -hmm. okay, which is anathema to many folks. But we do that already in a sense. We just have smugglers in Mexico uh, collect the fees for us. They're auctioning the right to get into the United States. The so-called coyotes are going to make more money. The, the more difficult we make it, the more money they get. So. If we shifting money to them, yeah. well, why don't we collect those fees instead through a humane, uh, humane system? Um, you also want uh, a system that's going to allow uh, immigrant workers to uh, to have their visas be portable, 
to move easily between employers in the United States. And for that, you need very flexible matching of workers to employers, a monster.com uh, for, for immigrant employment. Um, we're a long way uh, from that. Well, given all the other issues on the table, one of these gentlemen is going to become president. How realistic is it that they can make this a top priority? Do you expect that this will be a very number one priority, or will this fall in attention? Obama, Short answers, both of you. Obama has made this a clear, unequivocal commitment. Mm -hmm. he, will, he will attempt to do comprehensive reform in his first year. Whether he can pull it off really depends on the results of the congressional elections. Does he, will he have 60 votes right. in the Senate to support this? Right. That's what we all tell our students that Congress matters. Gordon, what optimistic, optimistic or not that they can do much? I'm utterly pessimistic. I see no pressure for a Democratic president uh, to implement immigration reform in his first term. I don't see any reason why Obama would want to risk this before his, his, his reelection given the other things that are clearly more important to him, uh, dealing with health care, dealing with uh, the energy sector and, and climate change, um, uh, how, how he reconstructs U.S. foreign policy. All of those are going to take precedence. If, however, he wins the presidency with the electoral votes of four or five states in which the Latino vote has been decisive, he's that not going to be able to walk away right, from that away. commitment. Right. Well, Gordon and Wayne, this has been great. This is an extraordinarily interesting topic, very high voltage and temperature, and we managed to get through with it and still be friendly and polite to each other, and I hope that's also true of what happens in America. I'd like to thank Wayne Cornelius and Gordon Hansen of UCSD for joining us tonight on The Body Politic. The Body Politic will be back next month with more analysis of the issues making news in this presidential campaign. Until then, I'm Peter Gorovich. Thank you, and good night.